Lord. Amen. Brothers of mind and voice and vocal cords and nerve supply and all of that that you just saw happen by chance. Yeah. Uh, the gift of God and then developed by practice and diligence. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, sister. Yeah. And all the glory and honor to God, the Creator. Yeah. Yeah. Let us pray. Gracious Father, as we come now to our last lecture of the morning session before lunch, and as we go into Bible prophecy, looking at the principles and the issues at stake, teach us, edify us, sanctify us, keep us in Christ. In his name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Now, last night we said that prophecy, and as, soon as, as, soon as, as soon as I start the PowerPoint, I've been asked by the videotapers to come to this side so I wouldn't obstruct. So I'll do that. Last night we said that prophecy is history written in advance. Now, things do not come to pass because God foretold them. Listen to me carefully. God foretells them because he sees that they will come to pass. Is a, there's an important difference there. You see, there are those people who believe that everything is predestined and that there's really no choice. But God's foreknowledge does not interfere with our freedom of choice, and that is another mystery of God. God knows what you are going to cook next month on the 15th before you have even made up your mind. But that he knows what you're going to cook on that day is not going to interfere with your freedom of choice. He knows beforehand what you will freely choose to cook that day. That is the mystery of omniscience. So things do not happen because they have been prophesied. They have been prophesied because God foresees that the interplay of human choice will produce those results. Are you with me? So prophecy is not predestination. Prophecy is history written down in advance. Very important principle. Another important principle is that if you look on the screen, uh, last night we looked at Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, last night, and for those who are visiting with us, um, of course, we can only give you certain basic principles in our short time here, but our visitors, you can read Daniel 2 in your lunchtime, for example, because we're going to come back to it tonight and tomorrow. But in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He saw a terribly brilliant, majestic metal image. That's what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, Legs, thighs and legs, lower thighs and legs of iron, and then feet of iron and clay. That's what he saw. He did not remember the dream, and he wanted to know the interpretation. And he asked the wise men of Babylon to give him the interpretation. 
And they told him, King, if you want the interpretation, give us the dream. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a very serious man. We said last night that on the approach of Nebuchadnezzar, kings had diarrhea. Men would tremble and faint on the approach of Nebuchadnezzar's army. The Bible calls him the destroyer of the Gentiles. He was a terrible man. You know what Nebuchadnezzar told those wise men? You are simply stalling for time. If you can't tell me both the dream and its interpretation, I'm going to kill you, your wives, and your children, and make your houses a manure heap. Now that, that's the, those are the words of a tiger. Say this man. <coughs> so are we out the chief police went and told the news? And they came to Daniel, and just recapping last night for those who are now with us for the first time. Daniel chapter 2, good reading for our visitors. Next time you read it. Daniel said, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Tell the king, just give me a couple of days. I will pray to the God of heaven, and I will give him both the dream and the interpretation. Now Daniel had to be close with God. He had to know God. He had an experience with God. And he trusted God. Now Daniel knew that Nebuchadnezzar was not a man to sky up with. Daniel already had a run-in when Daniel refused to eat the king's food in the university during his three-year degree course. And the king, if anybody refused to eat the king's food, they would also have lost their head. Nebuchadnezzar was a, a, a quick to execute. Daniel prayed and the dream and its interpretation was made known to Daniel. And Daniel told the king, God has shown you what is to happen. The kingdoms, the empires that are to follow you. You, Nebuchadnezzar, your Babylon is this head of gold. After you will come another kingdom, another empire inferior to you, and then a third, and then a fourth. So the Bible predicted that there would only be four world ruling empires coming in contact with the people of God, the covenant people of God. Of course, China had an empire and India had an empire, but they bore no direct contact with the people of God. So Bible prophecy brings to view empires that had to do with the great controversy directly. Are you following me? Well, in Daniel chapter 2, the prophet said, eventually, empire will be divided. Babylon was the first world, world ruling empire, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, at first under Alexander, and then his four generals, then Rome. As the lives are long, Rome was the longest world ruling empire, and it was Rome that was ruling when the Messiah was born. Yes. Anybody can tell me the Caesar under which Christ was born and the Caesar under which Christ was crucified? He was born under the reign of Augustus Caesar, who was, according to historians and Ellen White's comments, the most illustrious and the best Caesar of Rome. Rome. And you can tell me what I was mentioned in Daniel 11. The two Caesars. Open your Bible with me quickly. Daniel 11. Daniel chapter 11. Verse 20, verse 21. Daniel 11, verse 20, verse 21. The two Caesars in Christ's life on earth. Daniel 11, verse 20, verse 21. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. What are we told in the New Testament? 
In the days of Caesar Augustus, the whole world was taxed, and Joseph was engaged to Mary and brought her down to Bethlehem to be registered to pay taxes. And Christ was born. Augustus didn't last long. He died of illness. Verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Politicians have always been politicians. Tiberius Caesar. And it was under Tiberius that Christ was crucified. Born under Caesar Augustus, crucified under Tiberius. So Rome was ruling the world when the Messiah was born. Then later on, the emperor became divided. Last night I explained what an emperor was. An emperor was a number of kingdoms conquered by a supreme dictator. Nebuchadnezzar conquered the then known world. He conquered Israel. He conquered Egypt. And if we have time tonight and tomorrow, I will get into some uh, deeper issues in Daniel 11, what Egypt now means, and so on. Those are advanced principles we will look at later on. I'm just going through some basic principles first. Now let me just mention this. Ever since Satan got Adam and Eve to sin, Satan's aim has been to set up a global government on earth in complete opposition to the kingdom of God. That is Satan's aim. And God intends to establish his kingdom in the hearts of those who choose his government. So in this alien province, because the Apostle Paul says that Satan is the God, common G-O-D, of this world. So while Satan's government is, as it were, the official government of the earth, using the word official to mean that Adam voted him in and voted God out, God has remained present enough to do a number of things. First of all, he has appointed his angels, and the Holy Spirit works through those angels, listen to me carefully, to hold in check the forces of evil, Revelation 7, 1 to 3, so that we have opportunity to survive and vote a second time, as individuals this time. Amen. Let me tell you something. I'll get to some of that tonight and tomorrow morning. The angels are involved in holding in check the forces of evil. You have angels in charge of the wind, angels in charge of the oceans, angels in charge of the earth, angels in charge, and each of us ha has a guardian angel, angels in charge of all of these operations. And the physics and the chemistry are beyond our understanding. But ever since God was voted out and Satan voted in, all of the forces of nature inside our bodies and all around us became twisted out of the right path. And such forces of nature twisted out of correct operation are called what? This morning when uh, my wife was presenting, she mentioned that she started out by saying that God is infinite in power, wisdom and love. And that God is committed so only using his power in righteousness. You got that? I have power in my muscles, in my arm. I can help an old lady across the road, or I can snatch her bag and love her. That's what freedom of choice is all about. Now God is fixed in his mind that he only uses his infinite power by infinite wisdom for the good of others. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So God never uses his power to hurt or kill. He uses his power only to give life and do good. That's a fixed principle inside God. 
That's what the Bible tells us in James 1.17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God does not vary an inch from the principle of only using his power by wisdom to produce good. Amen. That's God's government. Amen. Satan, on the other hand, uses his power, and it's the power that God has given him as a creature, to confuse, deceive, kill, destroy, and hurt, and then charge God with it. You got that point? And it's amazing. You read the whole Bible. And you've not paused to study it carefully. You never see in the Bible written down in words that Satan killed anybody. <laughs> All you see is God licking up and God smiting and God destroying. And you never see Satan recorded as killing anybody. Which means there is a language problem in the Bible that we have to get straight. Because when Jesus came here, Jesus said that Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Amen. And not a record of his killing anybody in the Bible. <laughs> that is why Sister White says that misinterpretation and tradition have obscured people's understanding of God. And she even says that Bible language is what Satan hides behind in blaming God for destruction. That's written down the great controversy. So what is the principle of Bible language? If God did not prevent something, the Bible writers wrote it down that he was the cause of it. But we know in these last days must get into mechanism and see what is happening. And God is so patient and long-suffering. And as so many lies have been told about God, and God is patiently waiting for the truth to be understood, for us to clear his name. He's waiting on us to clear his name, you know. Amen. Even the angels, we are told, have to understand, as we've done in Ephesians 1.10, even the angels have to understand these things through the church. So we are responsible for clearing God's name. That is how selfless and humble God is. Now, God in establishing his kingdom of grace sent his son to our earth. I want to point out that truth is interconnected. If human beings have an immortal soul and cannot die, then the cross of Calvary was a farce. Because it meant that Jesus did not die. Don't get vexed with me. I don't want our visitors to get vexed with me. But a friend of mine went to a church in America to attend a funeral. This is how the minister started. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to inform you that the deceased is not dead. That's what the funeral started. And this sister, as we say in Caribbean terms, does not cover her mouth. So she said, why we have a funeral then? <laughs> the absurdity of the doctrine of the immortal soul. The dead are really dead and remain in their graves until the day of resurrection. Jesus died, really died, to save us. And Jesus suffered not only a first death, death of what we call the body, but his actual mind and thinking, what we call soul function, was separated from God by our sins, so he died the second death for us. That's what God had to do to establish his kingdom here. 
And Jesus, as you know, took on our sinful fallen flesh, was tempted in all points like as we are, overcame, subjected our human nature to the law of God. And by the way, the righteousness of God and the law of God are the same. The law of God is the righteousness of God written down on paper. But I'm going to ask this question. Who really is the righteousness of God? Christ. Christ. Thank you, sister. Christ is the righteousness of God. So the righteousness of God is not just a written code. The righteousness of God is a person. Christ is the wisdom and righteousness of God. It's for the prophecy, Mount of Blessing, page 90. We have this amazing statement. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. What a profound mystery. So when we sin, we are not just breaking a written code, we are breaking the heart of a person. And I always tell this story. Uh, when I was a little boy growing up, I was the first son. My mother had, my mother, father had six children. I was the first child and first son. She had no girl children. The girl came and ate them. So she taught me to cook, wash, clean the house, press clothes, everything. Okay? So I still let my wife sleep on Sunday mornings and I cook every Sunday morning. <laughs> Ask her if she doesn't enjoy it. And my mother would put me by the window and say, press all of those clothes before you go and play cricket or go in the sea. And my friends would pass by the window. <laughs> be ready to play the game. Be ready to go in the sea. And you press the clothes? Go in the sea? And my mother would say, yeah, moving from there to you press all those clothes. You know the old time, they can't tell children so now. It's the old time days. I would press all the clothes. But I would press those clothes many a day and sweep the house out many a day in a pharisaical manner. Do it because she was telling me to do it, but I wanted to run away and go to see with the fellows. And one day she saw me with my face set up. Are you still sweeping the house? And this is what she did to me. It's a lesson I will never forget. She said, uh, Elliot, bring the broom. Now my mother, the thing about my mother is that she had one leg from 16. She climbed the tree and fell down and the rupture, fractured the, the, the thigh bone, the femur and the heel, but the artery supplying the femur with blood, that little tiny artery was ruptured. And so she suffered what we call in medicine, infarction and necrosis, destruction of the bone, which in those backward days they didn't realize. And that leg hurt her, and eventually, at 60 years of age, she had to get her amputation. 60 years of age. So she called me and told me, I give me the broom. That it, this, is a, this is a particularly Caribbean experience. She said, your one foot mother will sweep the house and do everything <coughs> because she loves you. You go along with the fellows and leave me to do everything. But let me, let me tell you something. She didn't have to raise a belt or say anything else. I started to cry. She started to cry. We embraced. And I swept the house with a smile and did everything from then on. What happened? Love melted the heart. And then I was glad for it because when I went to university then in Jamaica, uh, at Mona, they had fellas who come press the plants. I had to press it for them. Fellows who can cook. So I, I then look back on the discipline and thank God for it. Amen. Amen. So when God sent his son to reveal his character and to die for us, God intended to show us such unconditional love that we would understand that his government is the only government worth voting for and serving. Amen. And when he said that sin produces death, he did not ask us to die that death. He sent his son to die it for us 
to show us that it is true and to save us from it. So no man need to die the second death. If we die the second death, we've rejected all of that love, all of that salvation. So Jesus really died to show God's love, to show the truth. And therefore, because of the death of Jesus Christ and God's love, God can establish his kingdom in the hearts of those who on planet Earth, under Satan's government, choose God's kingdom. So, for example, here in the United States of America, Chinese come and live and other nationalities, and Bajans and Jamaicans. And the Jamaicans will keep eating Aki. <laughs> and the Bajans will keep eating Kuku. <laughs> and the Chinese will use their chopsticks. Although they are in America, they maintain their kingdom. Now God wants us Christians, although we are in Satan's kingdom, to maintain the culture of heaven. The righteousness of heaven. Amen. Amen. So amidst all the McDonald's and fat, we are to eat heaven's diet. Amen. Obey heaven's laws. Amen. So Satan, when Satan sees that, he gets vexed. He doesn't want any person in his government going against, in his world, going against his government. He wants everybody under his control. So Satan has always been trying to set up a one world system and eventually to kill or get rid of those who show loyalty to the kingdom of God. That's what prophecy is all about. So in Daniel chapter 7, when Daniel himself saw these world emperors, Daniel 7, Daniel saw a lion. He saw the wind blowing on the water. In Bible prophecy, wind represents international strife, Jeremiah 4 and Jeremiah 25. The sea, Revelation 17, 15, represent peoples and kingdoms and multitudes. And so when Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, said he saw the wind blowing on the sea, and four beasts come up. A beast represents, again, a world emperor or a world government. And Daniel saw the lion, followed by a bear, followed by a leopard, followed by a terrible, nondescript, dragon-like monster with iron teeth and ten horns, representing the first four emperors. Turn to me, uh, next slide. So last night we saw that in Daniel 2, it is gold, silver, brass, and iron, the first four were wooden emperors, Represented by the lion, bear, leopard, and dragon-like monster. And the meaning, Babylon, 604 to 539 BC, the first world ruling emperor. Media Persia, under Cyrus, under Darius, and then Cyrus, and then the others, 539 to 331 BC. Greece, under Alexander, and then his generals, 331 BC to 168. BC, and then Rome from 168 BC to 476 AD. The first four were ruling emperors. And what was Satan aimed under all of these empires? To obliterate the kingdom of God, to wake up the people of God, and to prevent the Messiah from being born. So, when the Jews departed from God and lost their defense, the Bibliotheca came and conquered them. Do you remember, remember in Daniel, if you could never have a dream, and Daniel interpreted it as we just said, and then the Duke of Nazar, in defiance, built a golden statue and commanded everybody to bow down to that statue. You know what he was saying? Okay, Daniel, your God is telling me that after me will be other kingdoms. Well, I don't intend for anybody to be after me. I'm going to reign forever. So he set up now an image of all gold to defiantly say, nobody's coming after me to conquer me. I am going to be here as gold forever. And to prove it, anybody who doesn't bow down 
I'm going to put them in the fiery furnace. That's the kind of man that Nebuchadnezzar was. Daniel was away on business in Elam. By the way, Daniel in his frequent trips to Elam, that is how eventually he met Cyrus. Daniel met Cyrus and told Cyrus, one of my prophets called Isaiah has mentioned your name a hundred years before you were born. Eventually, you are going to conquer Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon and you are going to set the people of God free to go back and build our city. And Cyrus said, what? Your prophet mentioned my name before he was born? Yes. So Cyrus and Daniel developed a relationship in his visits to Elam. More that later on. But you know what happened? The three Hebrew boys refused to bow. Now notice church state principles here. Nebuchadnezzar was in his right to call his subjects to an assembly. So they went. But he crossed the line of religious liberty when he commanded them to worship an idol. They said, King, you have commanded us to come here, so we are obedient to that principle. But now you've crossed the line. You're asking us to worship a God, to go against our faith. We will not do it. He says, I'm going to put you in the fiery furnace. They say, well, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we are not worshiping you. So the big has got blue, red, purple vents. I made the furnace seven times harder so that the policemen who threw them in were killed. And when he looked, he saw four instead of three. And he said, the form of the four is like unto the son of God. Amen. Oh, he knew the son of God <laughs> by seeing Daniel all through university, yes. by seeing these boys stand for principle and showing love. Yes. And then now, still not fully understanding God, he went to the other extreme and said, well, anybody now who does not worship God, I'm going to kill. <laughs> but God was working peace meal on the Duke of Nazareth's heart. Yes. And eventually, Nebuchadnezzar ended up being saved. Amen. So listen, it would be a shame for any of us to be lost and the king of Babylon end up in heaven before us. <laughs> so Daniel and his three companions witnessed and witnessed and witnessed the Nebuchadnezzar and after his seven years of humiliation eating grass, he came to, his, to himself and his senses and surrendered to the God of heaven. What a wonderful God he, our God is. He's always in the business of trying to save. Amen. Here was Satan's man, the king of Babylon, killing those who opposed him. And here was God seeking to save Satan's man. Yes. That's our God. Mercy. A merciful God. So all through these emperors here, even, even eventually, remember when Cyrus got the people of God back down, he and Darius and the other and the other one, are his artsies, signed the decree, so they went back down. 457 BC, they went back down and uh, started to rebuild. You remember that some Jews decided to remain in Middle Persia? Yes. And what happened? A man called Haman was Satan's man. Yes. And Satan said, Can you use Haman to get rid of these Jews because my aim is to destroy the messianic line, right? I understand that this Messiah is to come. I want to prevent him from coming. So Haman wanted people to worship him. Mordecai did not worship him. And he built a gallows. Remember the principle we learned this morning? Yes. If you dig a hole in the sand, you will fall in it. He built the gallows. And he didn't realize that he was building that gallows for Haman. He thought he was building it for Mordecai. He built it very efficiently. And it was his wife who gave him descendants, you know. No dessert. Because when eventually, by the way, God, God is an amazing God. Uh, how did Esther become queen of Persia? By entering a beauty contest. How did she get to be this man's, this king's wife? The king had put away his first wife because she refused to show off. So it was an unlawful divorce, and he married Esther. God meets people where they are and works with them. And 
all through that situation, he used Esther as the woman to deliver the Israelites. It shows another dimension of God's character. He meets people where they are and brings them to where he is. He doesn't, he's not in the business of condemnation. He's in the business of saving. And still, he does not compromise principle. What a God. So, well, Haman eventually ended up on the gallows that he built. Then came Greece. And Satan decided, you know, that trying to kill off the people of God wouldn't necessarily work. So he used now Greek philosophy to corrupt Jewish theology. And the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, which was concretized by Plato and Socrates, infiltrated Jewish theology. So that the Jews came to believe in an immortal soul as well. So when Satan can't get through by physical persecution, he uses the strategy of corruption of doctrine. Then came the Romans, and you know what happened? The wise men came down to visit Jesus, and Herod called him and said, when you find where Jesus is born, come back and tell me so I can go and worship him too. Herod wanted to kill the Messiah. And then the wise men were warned in a dream and went another road back home. Herod ordered the killing of all baby boys under two. You see how Satan operates? Force and destruction. To show that God doesn't use force and that God allows sin to run its course, we are told that when John the Baptist was in prison, about to be beheaded by Herod, because of Herod's association with his brother's wife and so on, we are told that in the book Desire Visions that Jesus was told by his father not to go and visit Herod at that time, otherwise he would imperil his own life. What does that tell you about God? You understand what I'm saying? Are you all following me? Yes. If God used force to put down his opponents, he would simply tell Jesus, you can go and visit John the Baptist anytime because if Herod touched you, I'm going to let him up. But because God does not use force, he told his son, you don't visit Herod at this time. Let things run. Don't visit John the Baptist at this time. Let things run their course. So sin runs its course to destruction. God, that God never comes in to put down rebellion by force or to kill. What a God. What a God. Now, so for those who are visiting with us and not familiar with these prophecies, you can read Daniel 2 and 7 for yourself, and even 8, and see these symbols, these are the meanings. Babylon, Peter, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the first four were ruling empires. Now in Daniel 2, the iron and clay, the division of empire. Remember when pagan Rome divided, pagan Rome divided by 476 AD. I'm going to, I hope I have some time tomorrow to do the trumpets with you, the seals and the trumpets, and to bring in and to assure an explanation for what is happening now in the uh, Islamic world. Uh, people usually ask me, where is Islam in Bible prophecy? And how does the Bible relate to events in the Islamic world? We'll touch on that tomorrow. Please God. When Europe, when the pagan woman and Bar collapsed into the ten divisions of Western Europe, France and England and Spain and Italy and Switzerland and England and so on, and some primitive groups like the Aruli and the, the Ostrogoths and the Vandals. By the way, anybody knows where the Vandals uh, originated? What is the country now called that the Vandals came from? Or what the word, the word, we use the word Vandal now. The word Vandal is a real tribe of people that used to live in those days. 
but they burned up the Roman fleet in the Mediterranean, and the Romans coined the word vandalism for people who burned up their fleet. And we now use the word in that negative sense. But the vandals were real people. Okay? Yeah. Are where they originated from? Yeah. North Africa. Yeah. And which, which, which country that we now have a name for? Libya. The vandals lived along the northern coast of Libya and put some blows in the Roman Navy in the Mediterranean and burnt that Navy and were instrumental in the complete collapse of the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire collapsed, you had the, the kingdoms of Europe. As the pagan empire collapsed, emperors like Constantine wanted still to keep the emperor together. And that is what gave rise to the development of this little horn. The little horn in Daniel 7, little horn in Daniel 8, symbolizing the papacy. Now this is a, a crucial point to our visitors. The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 had mentioned that there would be a fallen away. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that there would be a fallen away of the early Christians.